Hi, I'm Phil Whitby. I'm a developer here at Swiftcase. You're watching the third video in my bias series. And today we're going to look at something called hedonic adaptation. Now there's a famous quote that uh, gets bandied around the internet uh, quite often by John Lennon, which goes like this. When I was five years old, my mum told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I was older. When I wrote down happy, they told me I didn't understand the assignment and I told them they didn't understand life. Now this is a great quote superficially because John Lennon was very successful. So anyone that makes any quote or reference to uh, happiness or how to be happy or gives advice who has been or financially and you know, um, fame-wise quite successful, people tend to take it as uh, particularly good or gospel, if you like. The problem with this is that when you actually analyse the uh, content of the quote rather than uh, the authority who said it, I mean, it really doesn't stand up. First of all, he's using his mother as a source, which really is, a, is an appeal to authority that no one else will feel you know, has authority, except for the fact that she is John Lennon's mum. Also, happiness is such a meaningless concept, because when you break it down and try to define it, well, not only will the definitions change between people, but it's almost difficult to describe happiness as a long-term concept. So we understand what it's like to be happy, you know, when it's on our birthday and we get presented with a nice surprise party, or get something, buy something new, get married or have a baby. But this is a fleeting, very short-term experience in most people's um, understanding of happiness. So when you say about you want to be happy long-term, does that mean that you have this very distinct, elated feeling continuously for the rest of your life. Is that really something that you can achieve? Isn't that what heroin addicts are trying to achieve? Do they look like they're doing well? So it's a long-term concept. It really doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Another interpretation of it is, well, maybe happiness long-term means less ups and downs. So you know, you're less grumpy and you're less extremely happy, but generally you're content, as people like to say. But if that's the sense, if that is the case, then happiness is that extreme feeling. Isn't it completely redundant to refer to it as happiness? If you're gonna have less of that extreme feeling as you get more content. Another way people think about happiness in general is that they have, don't have invasive negative thoughts about their life. And a lot of depression can be punctuated by these invasive thoughts about you know, uh, other people, your family, uh, your job situation, yourself, whether you have self, you know, self-esteem, self-worth, invasive thoughts about, negative thoughts about that, that kind of thing, um, is often related to unhappiness. The problem with trying to eradicate these thoughts is that it's almost impossible. People have a train of thought which they dip into and witness, you know, particularly a certain part of the day. And it's sometimes bubbling up in the self-consciousness and it's not very, very straightforward to put a lid on these things and any attempt to put a lid on them can only make people less happy. So there really is no way to sort of define happiness as a long-term uh, concept in any sort of way that people are used to talking about it. Now Buddhism has some insight into this and some Buddhist teaching is about peace of mind being possible through uh, avoiding craving or desire. They call it equanimity. So the more pleasure you seek, you know, the more diminishing the returns of, of pleasure. So most people have a very intense happiness inducing experience and then spend a large part of the you know, future trying to regain or retain that experience, be it you know, a drug experience, a lifestyle experience, a food experience, a work experience, any, any kind of uh, event. Um, which is why um, addiction can be so cruel, because people have an initially fantastic high and then spend a relentless you know, rest of their lives committed to trying to retain that high or you know, retain some portion of it. So when you become you know, um, desensitized to happiness, uh, we call this hedonic adaptation. And um, hedonic adaptation is where your body or your mind generally adapts to these um, pleasant or unpleasant uh, events 
um, and comes to terms with them very quickly and your general happiness or reported happiness level goes back to whatever you were prior to the event. So a lot of lottery winners will report extreme happiness for the first few days after winning the lottery, but then very shortly afterwards, they will then reset to what we call the hedonic set point, which is their general happiness level. Now on the flip side, you know, if somebody um, has a terrible life event happening to them, even though it does generally tend to take longer to uh, revert back to the hedonic set point, a reversion is usually reached. So people generally go back to their um, original happiness level or original reported happiness level. And this can be seen by people living relatively normal lives in war zones in Vietnam and Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, um, that's not just soldiers, that's civilians as well. And even though they may see death and destruction, you know, um, they de do tend to carry on and somehow um, engender a philosophy that allows them to maintain a hedonic set point. Even something as uh, devastating as like paraplegia that happens to you as a, due to a car crash or some kind of accident. I mean, um, one study showed that after a few months, people that have made paraplegic or quadriplegic after an accident reported, you know, a uh, hedonic or happiness level only slightly below the average at that age or for their age, sorry. And even, you know, thought 30% of parents who've had children who've died from sudden infant death syndrome report no significant depression um, in a year after the event. I mean, this study also tested whether these people were just suffering from a, a delayed grief, um, so where people live in a state of denial and then later it sort of hits them, and this turned out not to be the case. But this isn't the whole story. People don't just become desensitised to all kinds of pleasure as time goes on until people are just depressed. What seems to or appears to happen is that when people have particular interests or fo foci or things to focus on, um, they can be sensitised to, to differences within that sort of field or realm. So a good example of this is, you know, most people like wine um, or drinking alcohol. Um, but when you're a wine taste, if you're into wine tasting, you know, subtle differences between wines that may be undetectable to other people can be really large, you know, huge in your mind. So you can be disgusted by one bottle of wine and really delighted by another. And people who aren't interested in wine tasting may not even be able to tell the difference. You know, to them it may taste like Ribena with a bit of perfume in it. I mean, another good example is how um, uh, the older generation or some people can say, oh, all music sounds the same. But when you're interested in music and you have a particular interest in a genre, you can tell there seems to be massive differences between bands in the same genre to which other people would not be able to tell the difference or derive no pleasure from whatsoever. And those subtle differences can mean the difference between you hating a band and absolutely loving a band. And this, I think, is represented absolutely um, clearly when you have a favourite band and you hear somebody who sounds just like them and it's clearly either ripping them off or trying to pay homage in some kind of way. It can lead to revulsion in a, in, in a lot of listeners. Um, but somebody who kind of is more eclectic and brings elements of three or four different bands, say, into a new sound, that can elicit, you know, great passion from a lot of people. So whatever happiness is, people still report a level of happiness in a survey. You know, the events in your life don't seem to have a great impact on your level of reported, general level of reported happiness. Um, they obviously do have some impact, but it's not as big as people think. And just as much of an impact is had by your genes. So it seems that if your parents or grandparents report a certain level of happiness, you're much more likely to report a similar level of happiness than you are between you know, unrelated people. So what's the lesson here? Um, are we not in control of our happiness? Well, that's not the message I'm trying to convey. Um, we're con we are not necessarily in control of our level of happiness, but we are in control of where we direct our attention. And it seems to me that if you want to have that kind of, those extreme feelings of happiness and, and good experiences, trying to seek out experiences that are like um, ones that cause you great happiness before can often be unrewarding 
but then finding an interest or a pursuit in which you can dig down and develop either a skill in or develop a kind of a real discrimination capability will lead to more happiness or events or instances of you feeling extreme. As we mentioned before, you know, if you take an interest in, in music or wine tasting or art or anything, anything really, as long as you can directly focus your attention on it and learn, well then that's gonna be the source of you having those rewarding extreme uh, emotions that we might call happiness or ecstasy. You know, I think um, that Rudyard Kipling poem, If, talks about these things that and people like to quote that as well. You know, so triumph and disaster are imposters and that is kind of part of growing up and being a man, according to Kipling, is recognising that. And I think that understanding how hedonic adaptation works is what Kipling was talking about when he wrote that poem. And if anything, worrying about you know, the likelihood of uh, really you know, personal hardship or a devastating life event happening, actually worrying about it has more detrimental effects on your happiness than the actual event itself, which you're proven to recover from reasonably quickly and resume kind of normal functions. So really, we don't need to worry about potential life-changing, you know, devastating events um, because your brain has kind of got it under control. My name is Fuerkby, thanks for watching this video and hopefully I'll see you next time in my next video.